small and round because uh, we've already gotten started in such a kind of democracy. First, uh, well, fortunately, Christian introduced me a little bit more. Uh, the text in the book is actually correct as far as it goes, and it's very short. Uh, sort of, um, what I actually wanted to put up on the screen was the text, No Panic. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, the text describing the Earth in Hitchhiker's Guide is Arnold. And I hope, like that entry in that uh, dictionary, my entry in the booklet will be completed with mostly Arnold <laughs> after the talk. Um, democracy, the way we can it here, surprisingly, has all been about the universal concept that seems to be ruling the world that democracy is leadership and selection. I totally disagree. In fact, the original democracy, as practiced in um, Greece, especially Athens, was not at all about leadership selection. It was the participation of the people in the decision-making of the community. So they could actually express their opinions on various issues that affect the community. Of course, like all democracies, uh, they limited the number of participants. So in, in their case, the original meaning was a democracy equal demos in Kratos, the rule of the people. Uh, so, just as a reminder, it did not mean uh, choosing someone to run your business. Uh, in fact, as being Swiss and having practically the only uh, direct democracy in the world where, in fact, the people can take decisions at all levels of government, including the federal level, uh, to me, this was the only valid um, concept of democracy. Now, of course, I'm not a fan of democracy, but we have to recognize that democracy has uses. Uh, there are things like, well, uh, shareholder assemblies, where you elect who will run the company for the following year or a couple of years, uh, where you make decisions about the future of the company, where you uh, uh, vote on the status, and there too, uh, the voting is not one person one votes, but uh, it's proportionate to the ownership someone holds in the company. So there is various systems of allocating voting rights. As a pre-ocean participant in the language of Liberty camp said last uh, week, um, in his family, for example, they of course also vote as in any uh, group. And his children have one vote uh, each, and he has one vote, and his wife has ten votes. <laughs> so uh, there is never uh, necessarily a balance. It really depends on the influence. And especially in groups uh, where you actually know people, uh, some people will be highly respected and will get a lot of attention, and usually people will follow their advice because they are well known to have had good advice in the past. So basically, even in like uh, small villages or so, uh, you can very easily get into very productive debates about whether to build a school or a bridge or whatever, which is exactly what happens in Switzerland. Uh, in fact, uh, you could easily imagine that in a capitalist capitalist society, a uh, city would be run like a company, a corporation, where in fact uh, the owners of um, buildings and so on would actually work like shareholders who uh, elect uh, someone to basically run the business or they could outsource it to various corporations and if they like to work with the corporation, well, they, um, they would actually keep hiring them or change for another one. So basically, democracy in and per se would mean definitely participating in the decision making itself and the leadership concept of democracy is uh, quite horrid because no one can really represent us. Uh, we cannot delegate uh, powers. But at the very least, we would say that if we do delegate powers to someone, then we can only delegate powers we ourselves possess. We cannot delegate the power over somebody else because we don't have that power. Unfortunately, that's not how uh, modern democracies work. And we've seen this uh, wonderful presentation by Yuri, where we had charts about the unfreedom in the world, Belarus, Russia, etc. Now, the frightening thing is that uh, this is just statistics, but in reality, even highly developed countries in Europe are very unfree. The United States, in many ways, are very unfree. Uh, the government takes a lot of power, and, um, well, they often tend to abuse it. And, uh, 
there is two tendencies, of course. There are people who like to be in a little pond and who want to be big in the little pond, and there's people who want to be in a bigger pond and have more power. Now, unfortunately, those who tend towards a bigger pond uh, tend to be the ones who are less successful in the small pond. And also, in general, the more someone wants to have power, the more he wants to move up to higher levels of power. Uh, which is why the European Union has been successful in the sense of getting national politicians to vote in a certain amount of power towards the Union. Well, that has many benefits because, uh, well, first of all, a lot of politicians could move up to Brussels if you like, or down. Uh, they got more power, more prestige, and especially they became more remote from their constituents. Uh, so they're under less scrutiny, they're less supervised, and um, they don't really have to, you know, uh, explain everything. And, uh, there is class being sanctioned for decisions they make because it becomes very diffused. National governments tend to say, oh, you know, we have to do this because Europe says we have to. The EU uh, commands it from us. Um, Christian was a little bit optimist, I think, about the other institutions because uh, having international organizations run by governments is not necessarily a barrier against their power abuse. They, um, and it's not necessarily to have any conspiracy. In fact, people who like power naturally cooperate with others who want to have power, uh, unless they are direct competitors. So there is always this tendency. Of course, governments compete, but they also cooperate when they see a benefit. So there is definitely a natural trend towards higher integration among the top alpha dogs in the various uh, national governments. And, um, for example, in Switzerland, the cartoon is made a very nice, so uh, the drawing, uh, I like him, his name is Nielsen Remy, it's his uh, artist name. And he had this little drawing where you see a Swiss woman, a Swiss French person, who says, I have enough of being ruled by the Swiss Germans. I want to have new masters, I want to join the EU. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much says that, in fact, a lot of people project things that they do not get in the current system onto some external entity. And they think, oh, it would be better if we had like a superior government. Uh, the same thing goes with judicial systems. If we have a Supreme Court, the rulings of that Supreme Court will be better than the rulings of some lower court, which may or may not be the case. In fact, very often, the higher up you go, the more ideological it becomes. Uh, people who move up are already people who tend to like power, and they will value, um, let's say, down to earth, common, really uh, realistic decisions, uh, less than ideological decisions. Uh, the Human Rights Board, in particular, doesn't really make uh, such uh, great decisions in Europe. In fact, it went against the decision of the Swiss Supreme Court, which uh, made absolutely no sense to me, but uh, just recently. In any case, very often, you can have some superior instances that make very, very bad decisions, and there is absolutely no guarantee that higher up means more intelligent, more reasonable, uh, or anything. But at the same time, we can also not say that uh, being small and local means necessarily good. I mean, the mafia in Sicily has definitely ruled for a very long time in a small territory, and uh, it wasn't good at all for the Sicilians. So, uh, with the Camorra in Naples, etc. So, you have local overlords and global overlords, and um, they both have their problems. Well, anyway, uh, there is definitely this integration effort. Everyone aspires to, like, uh, well, we have to deal with global problems, the economy. Well, of course, the left wing is the first ones uh, who don't like the free movement of goods to people and especially capital. So they want to put barriers up for that. They want to actually attack, for example, a typical NGO. They have been lobbying for years and years to get a global tax on the flow of current of money, investment money, through the world. Now, if they get uh, their way, and of course the UN is fully supporting them, then uh, all financial transactions would be taxed, and the UN would actually get a direct tax income, which is one step towards uh, world government, of course. The same goes with uh, the courts and uh, the attempt to have military units uh, and uh, with making globally binding laws. And uh, yes, we can say, 
For some countries, it would certainly be progress. It's exactly like the European Union. For a country that was very oppressive and uh, backwards, of course, it, it was a benefit to join the European Union. It actually dragged them up, especially, of course, if they got money from the European Union too. Uh, but for countries like Switzerland, joining the European Union would be complete regress into a system where we would have no direct democracy, where our civil rights would be curtailed, where we would have far less uh, competition as we currently enjoy into our federal system, which works actually still better than the US system. US states have less independence than Swiss cantons. Uh, so, definitely, uh, integration to higher levels. What does that mean? Well, the UN, for example, is a very good uh, place to look at what such a world government might look like. First of all, the question is how would it actually uh, be selected? Well, uh, there's different possibilities. There could be simply politicians making up a new system or simply continuing the UN by giving them more power. You could have um, a system whereby governments would elect representatives through the parliaments or a system where people would directly elect uh, the members of the UN. Uh, as we see in the UN, uh, in the EU, uh, the election of parliament, uh, EU parliament members, yes, that does exist, but they don't have much power. The real power is with the commission, the European <coughs> the executive. The parliament really has very few powers, so actually the, even that level of democracy uh, that is leadership selection has already been abolished to a large degree. Now, in the UN, it's much, much worse. Uh, who gets into the UN? Well, when we look at the chart of freedom, we see that only very, very, very few countries are even remotely free. Uh, let's say maybe the first 30 countries uh, in the list of the 194 or so. Uh, the immense majority of the other countries are totally unfree. So what you get is a UN that composed essentially of dictatorships, of repressive governments, of totally corrupt systems, and they will make the laws for everybody else. <laughs> and it is very unlikely that this system would drag the rest of the world forward into more freedom. Uh, and that's definitely not what's happening. In fact, they selected for the Human Rights uh, Commission of the UN, countries like Cuba, Libya, and uh, who was in it right now? Oh, Zimbabwe, oh, Zimbabwe was selected uh, to head the, the office of um, food production. Which <laughs> 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 is really, as I see you all know, why this is really ironic and absolutely scandalous. But that's what they did. Why? Because, well, in Africa, for example, Mugabe being a total dictator and having just a uh, declared himself the winner of elections, which he obviously lost, uh, is still supported by all the other, other African leaders because, well, he's, he's a bastard, but he's our bastard. And this immediately shows uh, one particular aspect of electoral policies. Uh, it's tribal. Basically, uh, it's a modern form of tribalism. Uh, Christian said very accurately yesterday in the debate about Iraq that Iraqis didn't vote along party lines, they voted along um, uh, yeah, ethnic groups or religious groups, Sunnis, uh, uh, Shia, uh, Kurds, etc. They only got together at the point where they realized that it was to their benefit to do so. So at some point they said, um, there is a lot of money, and we, if we constantly keep blowing up the oil installations, nobody gets anything, so let's try to share. Which is basically a step of evolution through cooperation, which is of course the most efficient one. We all know that when goods cross the borders, uh, there is peace. If goods are blocked, then armies cross borders. Uh, so basically, uh, cooperation leads to integration, to, uh, to peace. But trade, of course, politi political integration does not necessarily lead to peace at all. In fact, uh, political integration leads to effects that are totally harmful. Um, in fact, a lot of decisions by uh, elected leaders are totally not democratic. Uh, we know from uh, the uh, public uh, policy theory that uh, basically uh, leaders
leaders who conspire can actually put through things that would never find a majority in the population at all. Um, public choice theory, sorry. Uh, public choice theory says that uh, what leaders, what political leaders will do is uh, they will get together and they say, Tiffy, I have say 30% of the votes behind me, you have another 30%. If you vote for my subjects, I will vote for yours. Now, of course, this is against every possible conceivable majority will, but this is what will be the rule of law. Uh, imagine this at a global level, where various countries conspire, and now we have all these oppressive governments, which will conspire and say, well, okay, the US contribute 25% of the funds of the UN, but we are much more, you know, we have like 160 votes, and they together with Europe have maybe 30 votes, and then you get the Human Rights Commission with Cuba and uh, Libya, etc. Uh, yeah, it would be pretty nightmares. Well, how about um, referenda politics as we have in Switzerland? Would that, that be the solution? Uh, as I said, the usual concept of democracy being leadership selection, well, the alternative is indeed that people actually make decisions on the level of uh, actual um, issues, which indeed completely changes the equation. A leadership selection always happens based on emotional and tribal criteria. This is my tribe, this is emotionally I feel close to such and such a person, uh, to such and such an ideology. That's how people select leaders. Now in Switzerland it's really excellent uh, as a case. We see that people when it's in a referendum, they choose based on rational arguments. Which of course is much harder for the leaders because it's much more difficult to get people simply to vote along party lines. In fact, many parties launch um, initiatives, especially on the left, the socialists, usually lose almost every referendum. And they don't even get the, the score for some of their proposals of their uh, election result. If they got 21% uh, voting for socialists, sometimes they only get 80% support for a referendum, or even less. So that shows that when people actually can choose on objective criteria, when the pros and cons are clearly explained, they might not vote along emotional ones. And this is, of course, exactly what politicians dislike so much. Uh, referenda are much more difficult to, to control. Well, the excellent example, of course, was uh, the initial uh, referenda by a uh, referendum on the European Constitution couple, uh, two years ago, when France and Holland rejected it. And just now, when Ireland rejected it again, and I love the reaction of the EU politician. Oh, they have to revote. <laughs> such as uh, they go against the will of 390 million people who have never been asked. <laughs> they meant the majority of the 390 million people might have agreed with the Irish. But you see on the internet, most people are extremely happy that they rejected it. But of course, politicians want to ignore that. In fact, they ran a poll uh, after which they declared that most Irish people had voted out of ignorance. That's really funny because uh, those who supported the new treaty <coughs> didn't seem to be very well informed, especially the president of, Iri uh, of Ireland, who was a very strong supporter, admitted himself that he had never read the treaty. So he was supporting something, he had no idea what actually was written there. And of course, uh, hardly anyone who supports it has actually read that horrible document. Uh, there is excellent reasons to re reject it immediately without having re read a single line of it. And even more once you start reading it. Uh, for starters, it's very thick, it's 900 pages. You don't find the contract of 900 pages. 900 pages cannot be the foundation of uh, values for uh, a large society, a large uh, uh, community like the European Union, that's totally impossible. Uh, the usual saying is, nobody's supposed to ignore the law. Well, we have about 10 million laws in the European Union. No lawyer, even the most brilliant one, could even know 0.1% um, of those laws. They all specialize in very specific uh, subdomain of the law, and only in a specific region. The US is pretty much the same, they also have about 10 million laws over the entire United States at all levels. So it's a complete nightmare. I mean, legislation has gone completely out of bounds, but to have a constitution that's 900 pages, 
that's the exact opposite of what a constitution is supposed to be. A constitution is supposed to be something that everyone can agree on. The United States Constitution in that is definitely an example, at least the um, initial ten amendments, which were brilliant, uh, really well thought out. And of course, exactly this is what the EU does not want. They don't want something simple, they want something completely obfuscated. In fact, the Constitution, well, the treaty, whatever you want to call it, says everything in its contrary. Uh, it's for free markets, but with strong controls. It's for, uh, say, popular rights and human rights, but you cannot claim them in any court. Uh, it actually prohibits, basically, criticism of the EU. Uh, you can be jailed for certain things. In fact, it has already been put into uh, uh, practice when uh, journalists from Spiegel in Germany criticized, actually found out about corruption scandal in the statistics office. One commissar, Presson uh, from France, was actually fired, but that was the only result. Nobody was jailed, nobody was accused, except for the journalists who ended up in jail. That's the EU for you. Now, at a higher level, how does it go in the UN? Well, uh, I, it, it would be hard to imagine a more corrupt institution than the UN. Uh, for starters, a couple years ago, there was a big strike at the Office of Labor, uh, one of the UN institutions, because of the horrible labor conditions. They complained about ex sexual exploitation, about um, mobbing, about horrible working hours, uh, overwork, overtime, and this is the organization that was supposed to improve labor conditions in the world. Uh, could not be more ironic. Uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization was until very recently headed by an ex Sudanese minister who has been involved in major corruption scandals and who lied about his age. Suddenly he said, I was not really born in 1945, but in 1954. That was just a little mistake that I never mentioned it, and that persisted in all my forms uh, for the last 10 years. Why would he lie about that? Because he wanted to extend his period as head of his office, which was very posh. So, um, and this is the guy who is supposed to defend intellectual property rights. I mean, brands and patents and copyright. Now, whether we agree with all of these or not, but at the very least, things like brand names, which actually identify individuals and attach their values to them, that is something that is worth defending. One should always know who is behind something, and the person who actually controls the mechanism for defending those um, um, those uh, identities and so on, should definitely be someone reliable and trustworthy. Well, quite obviously it's not. Um, the person who was investigating the meteorological office, which is behind the IPCC report on global warming, among others, uh, this woman was actually uh, feeling so threatened that you know, she asked the Geneva police to protect her from prosecution because she also uncovered huge uh, corruption. And if it hadn't been for the police of Geneva, which actually was this tiny uh, canton in a tiny country and not at all connected to the UN, she probably wouldn't have been able to continue her investigation at all. So um, we see that uh, as we move further up the ladder of political power, things get worse and worse and worse because it's more and more removed and people can less and less be controlled. And of course, uh, on, on average, we can estimate that out of the entire UN budget, about only 5% ever reach their intended destination, if that. Uh, very often also, they, they simply cannot do what they are supposed to do. Uh, in an interview, someone said that uh, when they were investigating cases of pedophilia uh, <laughs> and abuse by UN troops in Africa, they could not actually uh, come forward with all the results because that would have been uh, politically inconvenient for member countries such as Pakistan and Chile, uh, who had sent troops. So basically, the highest moral instance is the one that can actually not even control its own members. Uh, so, global democracy, uh, okay, let's, let's examine also the, the idea again of referendum at global level. Uh, just for a very funny case. Recently, uh, the Swiss uh, French newspaper ran a little poll Should we boycott the Olympic Games in Beijing? Uh, usually, they get between two and 6,000 votes over a week. 
Well, a couple of Chinese students in Switzerland sent the link to uh, Chinese uh, blogs and <laughs> websites, and within two days they had two million votes. <laughs> Well, okay, I think uh, we can simply surrender and say, okay, please vote us out of every, every right and every property we have, and just take it, you know. <laughs> if we have to vote against China and India, and uh, unfortunately what we see is that something we don't like to think about, but people still are very tribal. And uh, it can be a local tribe, it can be a global tribe, and the tribe can be political, ideological, or national. And people very much do think in those categories, although we would like them not to. We would like them to think as individuals, but uh, the immense majority of people are not yet at the stage where they think as individuals. In a lot of countries and cultures, the group comes first. Uh, the family, the, the clan, uh, the, you know, the, the ethnic identity, the ideological identity and so on, they are really values that they pursue, and uh, forcefully, and, uh, well, our liberal democracies are very small and shrinking, and I think the global democracy would simply be pretty much wiped out. In fact, uh, our rights would be taken away, and uh, we very quickly find ourselves uh, under, uh, under occupation by people who absolutely do not share our values. That is not the way we want to go. So, democracy, as it moves up is definitely a very bad thing. Democracy at the low level, especially voluntary democracy, definitely has uses, but at the local level, it's a nightmare. So, um, just say no to the UN, and if you can, say no to the EU, and any treaties that might propose. Yeah.